church family, we're grateful to have you with us this morning. We really, really do love you and are grateful for you. You know what? We pray for you often. You are, um, yeah, you're always in my heart. I'm always praying for you. And uh, yeah, I'm just grateful you're with us. If you're new among us, I hope that you enjoy our to- your time with us on this online experience. But let's pray and let's jump into worship. Father, we thank you for your goodness, God, and we ask that you would manifest in the midst of our praises. God, you'd minister to our hearts, that you would touch every part of our lives, God. And we pray, Jesus, that you would be glorified in in the midst of our praises, that all distractions would be put aside, everything that tries to steal our affection and our attention, and we put it all on you, Jesus. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Let's worship.
together Strangers, neighbors Our blood is one Children of generations Of every nation Of kingdom come So don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up, I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
lost my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. God, you're the one that saved us. Lord, and we just, we just want to put in perspective the fact that you are the one, the eternal God, the one we obey, the one we follow, the one we seek, the one, the, the only one that really matters in giving our affection to is all. You, Jesus. And I pray, God, in the midst of the storms and all the ideologies, all the, the war in our culture, God, may we know that we are yours, that you are our king, 
that we only go where you ask us to go. We say what you ask us to say. God, because we ultimately want to be children of light. So Father, have our hearts, have our intentions, have our thoughts, have our everything, God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, it's good to worship with you. Hey, let's uh, head on off to meet and greet time. Go ahead and share just something really good that's happening this week, huh? Well, good morning once again, church. We're hoping you're having a really, really good time. Honestly, you should see what we got going on here. We need like a behind the scenes, how we record service. It is really funny. I mean, I feel like, yeah. Anyway, I'll spare the details, but we're having fun over here. Hey, let me run through a couple announcements that, uh, that I want to just bring to you this morning. First, uh, if you're new with us, we have uh, an ability for you to just connect with us. We just know it's hard to connect in a virtual online fashion. So you see the, the bar below me right here. You can go to that link, you can fill that out, and we just love to say hello. We're not gonna spam you. We're not gonna you know sell your information. That's not what we're, we just want to say hello and to welcome you to our church. Um, and, and for everybody else, um, uh, including newcomers, there's a, a place for prayer requests. We wanna be praying for the things that are going on in your life. And so if you fill out that Connect card, we will, we will stay um, faithful to pray over you or the situation that you need prayer for. Um, if you are part of our church family, you say this is your church home, we believe in tithing and giving, and you can do that all online. If you go to our website, it's easy, and you can walk through all the steps, and, and now would be a great time to do that. Um, and, and while you're doing that, let me just share a couple things. Tomorrow we have our prayer walk. We do this every Monday night, and we pray for our city, we pray for our church, we pray for one another, those who come. And it's just a really, really powerful time. I'd really encourage you. If you haven't been, I would love for you to join us. It's a really good time. And so join us tomorrow night. We meet here at Calvary Fellowship at, um, at 8 p.m. And you can, just, you, you can just count on that we're going to be there. A couple new things is we would love for your help. If you are interested in helping out in all this media and filming and audio and slides and all this stuff and, and learning um, all, all, all what it takes to do virtual church, uh, we'd love for your help. Um, and so you can, you can reach out to me directly. You could even comment and we'll make sure we get to you. Uh, even if you're like, I don't know what it takes, I'm interested. You can say I'm interested and we just can show you and, 
and, and, and, and it's not even an every week commitment. We try to get some level of a rotation. And so we don't want to overwhelm you, but we don't want to overwhelm the team that's here as well. So we would love the help. We actually need the help. And, um, and yeah, so reach out. Also, we are, unfortunately, I feel like it just became summer, but we're looking towards fall. And if you're interested in being a group leader, we want to, uh, you know, there's a lot of still uncertainty of in-person Zoom. There's probably a mixture of both. If you're interested in leading a group in any shape or form, we would love for you to consider it. We think gathering in this time and being very intentional about community is vital in the midst of this time. Loneliness is already an epidemic. It is already something psych, uh, psychologists would say is an epidemic of our, of our time prior to COVID. COVID is actually even heightening it even more. And so we just don't want to view life alone at all. And so um, we'd love for you to be a group leader. There's a lot of different ways you could lead a group, uh, whether it's fellowship, book studies, devotions, all sorts of things. We're really open to that. So if you're open to any sort of uh, uh, a group that you may lead, Reach out to Stephen at TerraceFoursquare.org. Pastor Stephen would contact or connect with you and, and, and try to help you form a group and all of that. So think about it, consider it, and reach out. Okay, so we got plenty other announcements you can find in our, in our comment section, and we'd be happy to, uh, and you'll be able to see it, and you can reach out to us if you have any more questions. Last Sunday, last Sunday we lost a great church member, a great friend, a, a family member in our church, Jim Dotson. Jim, you would know him as a man who, uh, who he'll chat with you about pretty much anything as anyone who is getting coffee. He, he and Kim really served our coffee and, our, and our, they always would make cookies together and bring it to church or, or get donuts or some kind of treat. And, um, and, and we, we lost him. Uh, ultimately to a heart attack that happened a few days prior. And he loved Jesus, and we we're so grateful for who he is and his love for Jesus and, and for all that he did for our church and just the community he even brought to our church. And so we just, we honor the Dotsons. We honor, um, we honor all those in our, in our church community who are really grieving this moment. I certainly am. I've known the Dotsons for a very long time personally. And, uh, and we miss him. We miss him. And, uh, and so be praying. Be praying for us. Be praying specifically for Kim and Scotty. They, uh, they love Jesus. They're walking through it, as, as you, would, you would imagine. But be praying. And there'll be opportunities uh, more and more for ways you could serve them very soon uh, in this time. And so uh, we'll keep you contacted or we'll, we'll keep you in touch uh, of what's going on and and, and how you could help. So we love you, Jim. We love you, Kim and Scotty. And uh, we're just standing with you and, and uh, we're praying with you. On a, on a different note, before we even get to the message, um, one last thing I really want to share before we dive in is this, is um, you've been holding on for quite a few weeks now in terms of how, uh, how we are going about service come uh, this fall or even gathering, if there's options and all that, I sent out that, uh, that uh, uh, survey for many of you filled out. Thank you for your feedback. And so this is what we're going to do. Uh, starting August 23rd, we, were, we are going to have a 10 a.m. online option that is much like what you see right now. And then we're going to start on August 23rd, an evening in-person gathering. At right away, we, we won't have an evening online uh, uh, option uh, other than you could go back and watch what we premiered in the morning, and we'll have that up on YouTube as well. But, uh, but we have a physical gathering at the Korean Presbyterian Church of Seattle, and we're still figuring out just the time. It's going to be a 5 or 6 p.m. service, and so we're working out that detail. So we'll bring more and more clarity, but I want you to mark your calendars for August 23rd, Sunday night, we're really excited to gather uh, to, to a degree uh, with, one, with one another because it's going to be just awesome to see you in person. Um, and we're going to worship, get in the Word, and all that. So 
get ready for that. We're really excited and we will get more and more details to you. I know there's a lot of details we'll give you and we'll do it in email form. If you're not on our email list, let us know so we can get that all to you so you know what to expect. Okay, I'm taking uh, uh, quite a bit of time, but, I want, uh, but a lot of those things are very, very important for us to share. Today, we are jumping into John chapter 15. We heard a fantastic message last week from Pastor Isaiah Don, the youth pastor at Mill Creek. He just killed it. He hit it out of the park, and it was such a, a great word for our moment. And we were continuing on in John chapter 15. What we need to know about John chapter 15 is that these are his, Jesus' final teachings, the final things that Jesus wants to communicate with his followers, specifically the 12. And we get to this moment where he talks, and it's this famous, these famous verses, many of us use it, is we must abide or remain in Jesus and what that looks like. You know, another word really for abide is to stay present, to endure, to tarry, uh, um, uh, and to remain. And often it's really even uh, the next step would be to be in union with. And when I think about that, I think about, I think about marriage. You know, it's the union, the oneness we're supposed to have with our spouse. And, and although maybe not all of us have a spouse, uh, you can understand to a degree what this looks like. You've probably heard it or you probably remember your first year of marriage. Usually people say your first year of marriage is either your greatest, you know, because you're kind of in the clouds and wow, or it's one of the hardest times of your marriage. And uh, I wouldn't say it was the hardest time of my marriage, but it certainly was uh, the most interesting time to learn how to become one, to learn how to become a union together. We were both individuals and we have individuality, but now we're, we're, we're a couple becoming one, that everything we do affects the other person. And so you get into weird arguments like, do you put the forks up or down in the dishwasher? Or do you uh, put all the dirty dishes in the sink or you leave it on the counter? Or how you wash your clothes. I know this. My wife was really worried when we moved into our apartment, or I moved in before she did. We got married, and then we moved in together. Just want to get clarity on that so you know that we, you know, I'm just, just letting you know. Okay, but we, we, I moved in the apartment, and so I went shopping. And so I got, like, I got lunch meat, like, you know, turkey. And then I got, like, some steaks. I got a block of cheese, some jalapeno chips, because come on, somebody, give me some of those Tim Cascades. And then I got apples because I felt bad. That's, that's like literally all I got. And she walked into my, the apartment and she opens the refrigerator and she's like, what, what is this? Like, how, how unhealthy are you as a human being? You know, there's the radical difference. Like if she went shopping, it would be all vegetables, probably no meat. You know, I believe, you know, uh, meat, uh, the, the me in meal it's, oh, I don't even know how to say it, but you know, you see one letter difference between meal and meat. And honestly, it's really important that you have meat in a meal. That's what I'm trying to say here. And so, so there's this vast differences in our first year, all that to say vast differences of, of how we lived, what we liked and, and all of it affected each other. So we get in little debates on, on uh, toothpaste and what's a really a need? Do we really need that or do we not need that? We're learning each other how to actually be in a union. And the longer you go and the longer you communicate and the longer you spend time together and the longer you hash things out, the greater union uh, you have with one another, the, the greater way we abide with one another. And I think it's so with Jesus. So often, you know, maybe in the, even our early stages when some, some level of a storm hit, it can shake us and, and it makes us feel like, okay, how do we work through that? We go through suffering and we go through pain and, we, and there's failures and ups and downs and all sorts of things that happen. And the more we, we, we walk it through with Jesus, the more we know how to stay in union with him throughout every season. See, we're in a time where people know abandonment more than anything. We see kids, almost half of the kids that we see walk in, in, in America today will know what it means for one of their parents to walk out of the family. Half of the kids, they know, they know the opposite of abide. They know the opposite of someone enduring in their life. They know abandonment. 
They know, um, they know what it means for people to unjustly and unfairly walk away from Jesus. And, and we know what it means also to see people walk away from meaningful relationships for really no reason. But Jesus calls us to abide, to endure, to persevere, to, to stand in full dependence throughout every season, in every moment, in every conflict, in every question, throughout every doubt, we are called to abide. Did you know you can abide and have some doubts? Doubts aren't something to lead you astray. Doubts is just faith crying out for more. That's what doubt is. And that's what Jesus is calling us and his followers to do. When he's saying this in John chapter 15, which we haven't even read yet, but we will in a moment, when we read it, and he, he's saying this in the last moments of his life. He is leaving physically from earth. All they know is relationship physically with Jesus. We certainly know it spiritually with Jesus. And so he's preparing them that they are able to abide in relationship, in union with Jesus, even though he is not present in the physical aspect. He's encouraging them. He's reminding them, you can, you can still abide in me even when I'm gone. And so we get to John chapter 15, verse 1, and this is what it says. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You already you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me or abide in me and I, as, as I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you, will, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. See, Jesus is trying to get us close, and the first thing we, as we walk through the Scripture that we want to make sure we see is the roles Jesus begins to, to delegate. Jesus is the vine to this, 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 this bush, right? He is the vine, the, which the vine is the source to the branches, and we become the branches. But he says his father is the gardener. See, it's important that we know that Jesus doesn't work apart from the father, and the father doesn't work apart from Jesus. So if there was no vine, there would be no need for a gardener. If there is no gardener, there wouldn't be a vine. They fully depend on each other. He's saying something about the abiding union he has in the triune God. It's so important that we see that and understand that. And so he's, he's saying something about unity and union with God. And then he's turning to his disciples and trying to invite them into it and say, you can be a part of this as a branch. And so with that in mind, Knowing that, that Jesus is the vine, the source of life, the source of fruitfulness, the source of usefulness, the Father is shaping and at work in us as well. And so Jesus says this in the first way, in the first thing he says about abiding. He says, basically, abiding means we are shaped by the Father. See, he says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does not bear, uh, bear fruit, he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Now, let me clarify. It sounds really cruel, actually, that God would just see a, a, an empty branch and just get rid of it. To any sense of a gardener, and we have some in our, in our church, I definitely am not. I've said that many times. I can, I can dig a hole, but I can't keep something alive. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and so... He, 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 it seems cruel that the gardener would just cut off branches. That just doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? That's cruel. And, and what, so oftentimes when you read this, we're like, oh, if we don't stop producing something for God, then he's going to send us to hell. <laughs> you know, he's just going to cut us off. No, we got to look at it a little bit of a different way. 
He, it, it actually reveals God's faithfulness to us. That if we're coming out of Jesus and there's dead parts of us that are coming out, the, the gardener, it's not us who cuts it back. It's the gardener, it's the father who's cutting and trimming and pruning us. So, so that even though the pruning can hurt in our lives, God's, God's uh, uh, spirit and the fruit that he wants to produce in our life can vibrantly flourish in our life. It's radically important that we see that the Father's not abandoning us by cutting us off. He's actually shaping us to be more like Him. He says, so for those who abide in me, for those who pursue and stick to the source, that, that long for deep union with God, the Father is faithful to shape you. But it starts first and predicated upon our relationship with with Jesus. It's not, it's not, I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to, I want to be a moralist or I want to, I want to do, do, just do good deeds. It's, it's birthed out of a union with God, pursuing his heart. Because when he says, I remain in you as you remain in me, this, this collaboration means God's faithful to you. God wants to be with you. There's this beautiful invitation for deep relationship, that we can know God so much more deeply than just from a surface level. We, he wants to invite us into the deepest parts of His heart, and He wants to be invited into the deepest parts of our, of our heart. And as we start with that, we see the fruit of God. Actually, the fruit of doing that is that God comes in and shapes us, makes us look look differently. He said in other words and in, in other places of the scripture that, that he is, he, 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 we're his clay and he is the potter and he shapes us. He shapes us. He, he, he's, he's one, he's an artist. He's actually trying to actually take care of every detail. Make sure that every branch, and, and if we go back to that, every branch is bearing fruit. He is tending to us. His eyes are on us. A good gardener looks over and, and just and is always at work tweaking things. My wife, she loves gardening and this has been the time of her life that she's just in the garden all the time. And she's always out there doing something. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's just, you know, pruning a little bit here, moving this here, shaping it and and you know, she's always tending to any bush or whatever there are plants there is. I don't know what to call them, but she's shape I'm not a gardener. I'm telling you guys. Come on. But she's always tending and shaping it and always present in the midst of it. And that's what the Father is. That's what Jesus is saying. Every branch does not bear fruit. The Father begins to prune, begins to shape. It actually speaks of his care and his faithfulness to you. In other words, Hebrews 4 says this. Because we find out, he kind of breaks from this analogy and says, but this word has, has cleaned you already. And so we know that the pruning aspect of God comes from his word. We see that connection all in John chapter 15. And Hebrews 4 says this in regards to this in another way. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword or double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. He knows our, our, the attitudes of our heart. heart. He knows our thoughts thoughts. He knows our intentions. He knows everything. He knows the, the depth of our being and his words able to penetrate, it says, those places and shape us and change us and transform us into, a, into the image he's cultivating us into. He's shaping us into. So as we abide, we watch him shape us and change us to look more like him. The beauty of it is that it is by his mercy that he does so. He doesn't have to actually do this. He doesn't actually have to consistently tend to us. He's done enough for us by giving his life on the cross, but, he's, but we see the faithfulness of God throughout our days that every day he's a gardener shaping us and changing us and intentional with us. It's a beautiful relationship, and there's no way we could be that fully to him yet he still gives everything to us. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, man. Okay, so 
number two, he goes into and he basically says abiding with Jesus, abiding with him means we are useful to the Father. He says this, remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart, apart from me, you can do nothing. He's saying something about the source, first of all. You cannot get any level of sustenance apart from the vine. Apart from our relationship with Jesus, we have nothing to offer our world. Jesus says it this way, apart from me, you can do nothing. What does that mean? You know what the Greek word for nothing is? Nothing. You can do nothing without being fully attached to the source who is Jesus. We can't do anything independently from him that's worth doing. Whoa, that is like, Trevor, that's too much, man. Why would you say something? Put the brakes on, man. Like, what if I'm moral? What if I'm just? What if I do something that seems good to the world? Aren't I doing something good? That's not nothing, is it? Well, to a certain definition, yeah. I mean, I would say morality is better than immorality, right? But when we look at relationship with Jesus... What happens if we do something independently from God, we are starting to build our own kingdom and build a kingdom that doesn't have Jesus in it. And ultimately, let's say you have one success in your life. You do it yourself. You don't ask God for help. You, you build something in your life. You do, hey, you know what? I reached to this level of success in my life. I did it myself. I received no help. I did it, and, and you know, I'm the one to thank for it. What happens is we start believing the lie that that one moment and one success story means that all other success stories in our life we can do without God, which is a lie. We may do a couple things independently from God and do it in our own strength and do it quite well, but there's no way, no way can we actually do all things in our life without God. And I think if for anyone who's lived any sort of life and have faced any sort of pain, any sort of suffering, and the winds of this life just blast it at us, we understand we can't do life without the grace of God, without relationship with Jesus. See, we don't don't have relationship with Jesus so we can produce in our life. We have relationship with Jesus because of the love we have for Him, because of the love that He had for us. And when we find ourselves in that place, the fruit of who he is begins to manifest in our life. Matthew chapter 6 says that we seek the kingdom first and everything else will be added to us. When we seek the kingdom, we're actually seeking the king. And through that, we begin to see him and his heart and his and who he is in every part. His will and his ways begin to manifest through our life. You see, fruit looks different, or being useful looks a little different than what we think. I think when we think of usefulness, we think of, are we competent enough to to accomplish something? Do we have have enough intellect to, to make our way through whatever we need to make our way through? Are we prepared? It's like preparing a child or, or a teenager to get to college. You know, are they prepared? Do they know what to do on their own? Do they know who to call? Do they know if they're going to shop for and what all these other things do they know how to are they prepared are they going to be useful but galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the spirit in this way and we're going to start with the acts or the fruit of the flesh and then the fruit of the spirit it says this galatians chapter 5 the acts of the flesh are obvious sexual morality impurity debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and alike, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its its desires. 
Since we live by the Spirit, let us step, uh, keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. He talks so much about the fruit, but let me just take a side note because I think it's so uh, uh, necessary for our moment in the church in America right now. When we look at the acts of the flesh, you know what's unique? We're familiar with the sexual, like the sexual morality ones. There's four of them. There's four of them that, that, that Paul points out as acts of the flesh. There's two that are like a idolatry, those, um, uh, uh, you know, idolatry and witchcraft. I just kind of put them all in idolatry, worship something other than God. And then you have drunkenness. That's one, you know, there's, there's drunkenness. But the other eight are all about community, dissensions, divisions, factions, all of these things, fits of rage, selfish ambition, jealousy, all these have to do with community and the lack of unity in the church. And I just want to take this moment to say there's a lot of it right now, and it doesn't mean you're necessarily even a truth seeker because Paul's simply saying the acts of the flesh have lots of dissension, faction, division, that there's, there's jealousy, envy, there's separation. It just doesn't, it's not the heart of God. The heart of God is to be surrounded around the lordship of Jesus. And so we got to pay attention to, to the list here of the acts of the flesh. A lot of it is division. A lot of it is uh, uh, factions and disunity. And we can't tolerate that. It's, it's not of God, period. But he says this, in the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that would produce in our life. And if you see it, and as we read it, what you realize is the fruit of the Spirit is actually your character being built and being changed. Loved and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, all this stuff. It all is character being shaped in it. And also, all, ultimately, Paul says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And when we do so, we begin to see this flow out of our life. So the fruit that God is talking about isn't necessarily something we do. It's something he's creating us to be, to look like. And I think as we are created more and more in his image with all of these amazing fruits of the Spirit, the more we look like him, the more we radiate him, the more people will go, wow, there's another way. There's another way. Have you ever had someone come up to you? I've had... Say, I've never met a Christian like you. I go, well, you probably have. You just probably haven't given them the time of day. But, okay, I get what you're saying. They see a change in you. Or you have someone from, from your old life, right, that comes to you and says, wow, you've just been, you're just so different. What happened? Oh, God changed my life. They see the different. Why? Because you abide with him and he's shaping you. You're, you, you, can, you realize you can do nothing apart from Jesus. And so you become useful because he actually is shaping the character in your life. And ultimately, the more we depend on him, the more I think he trusts us. Doesn't mean the, the more we depend on him, he, he loves us. But the more we depend on him, he trusts us. And third is this. Abiding means we are aligned with the Father. Abiding means we are aligned with the Father. This is what he says towards the end of these uh, eight or nine verses. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown in the fire and burned. If you remain in, my, in me and my words re remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You see, here's the unfortunate part. He says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown to the fire. That there's unfortunately... An unfortunate end to you. Eternity is really at stake. There is heaven and there is hell. And here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, if I'm sick of you, I'm just going to break off the branches and throw you in the fire. It says clearly, and this is what Jesus says, if you do not remain in me. See, he's not worried about his faithfulness to you. He wills that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. But it's, it's our uh, 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 faithlessness that comes in. He stays faithful. But it's, if we remove ourselves from him, if we don't remain, you are like a branch that's thrown, that's fully use, youth, uh, useless. Why? Because there's no life in it. 
It gets no nutrients, no sustenance. Nothing can bear it. There's, it's just a, it's just a branch, and you'll, and 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 so you'll be thrown in the fire and burned. And it, and it's a hard analogy, but you become useless to God. Tough. But he says, but if you remain in me and and my words remain in you. Now he's combining this. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Man, isn't that the American dream? That we can just, bam, microwave Christianity. You know, we got, we got, we just snap our fingers, anything happens. No, that's not necessarily what that means. It's not necessarily what that means. He's, it's all predicated on, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ultimately, when, when we're ab- abiding with Jesus, when we're actively pursuing him, we actually long to know his will. We actually desire for our emotions and our thoughts and our heart and every part of our being to be aligned with God. And when we align with God, we're going to ask for things that God already wants to happen on this earth. See, uh, there's often times we maybe pray and we go, we think this is God's will and then it doesn't happen. And there's a lot of questions or answers I can give to that. Not enough for this time. I, I understand that it can be a, this can be a complicated verse. But ultimately, what's important is that we remain with him and his words take root in our heart and it will reveal the will of God so that in our prayer life, we pray prayers uh, uh, to God of what God already wants to do in this world. That's the goal of our prayer life, to discern what he's saying and then ask him for it. Yeah, he could do it sovereignly without us, but he's inviting us in because he wants to do it together. He wants to do it together. And, and that's so important about relationship on any sense. My son loves to, to build things and be really, really creative. And he always wants to do it together. He never wants to do it alone. Or he sees me building something. I'm not like a, that great of a builder, okay? So I'm not trying to puff myself up. <laughs> but, uh, but he always wants to help. Dad, can I help? Can I help? Can I help? And when I do, even though it's, he's not like, you know... <laughs> He just needs to grow up a little bit, and then he'll be a little more helpful, you know. Uh, his partnership with me matters. His heart to be with me matters. I can give him small tasks. Hey, son, will you go grab this for me? And he will. And that's something that happens. That's like our prayer life. We align with God, and he's, he's, we're partnering with him in, in his mission to rescue those in this earth. And that's what he longs to do. And ultimately, Jesus doesn't want anyone to perish, like I said. He wants no one to have eternity without him. He wants eternity with you. He longs to abide with us. And we see this so clearly because Jesus, just moments after this, just, just not, not long after this, he goes to the cross for us. He so loved the world, John chapter 3 says, that he gave that the Father gave His Son for us so that we can have life. He gave His beloved Son for us to bear His sin, or to bear our sin, to bear our burden, to bear everything that is wrong, to give us access to the heart of the Father. And that's the call today, is that we see what Jesus did for us. And we see that he still, even after giving his life on the cross for us, raising again from the dead so that we may have life, that he partners with us. He wants to live every moment with us. He doesn't want want us to detach for even a moment. A prayer I pray every day for my kids is, Lord, I want them. I don't want them to walk away from you. I don't want one day, even one day of their life to be apart from you. God, keep them bound to you that's his heart for us to be bound to be in union to be in relationship with him and and out of that relationship out of that union the beauty and the mercy and the grace and the fruitfulness that we begin to see will be unbelievable and so let me pray today and as we close I want to encourage you, if you don't know what an abiding relationship looks like, if you don't know who Jesus is, I want to invite you 
to respond and say, I want to give my life. I want to abide with Jesus today. And I would love for you to even, you could put something in the comment. You could send something on email or you can do the connect. We'd love to connect with you and walk with you on learning and learning what it means to abide with Jesus. Father, we love you. Father, we love you today. We ask Jesus as we go into worship that you would draw our hearts closer to you, understanding that you are the one, the source of life. You're the one at work, and our job is to live fully dependent on you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.
Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you that you remain with us. That you don't, you don't, there's no unfaithfulness to your name. You stay faithful to us, God. So I pray you draw us close. That we be a people who abide in you, Jesus. If you want to, you need any prayer or you want to respond in any way or want to talk to a leader or a pastor, we'd love to t- chat with you. Please reach out. You can do so through the Connect or, or just directly through our email. But we hope you have a great Sunday. We hope to see you next week, and we just really love you. We'll see you soon.